Okay, thank you all for joining us today. Um, so today, um, it's um, my pleasure to um, to be introducing Laura uh, by Balota. Uh, so um, she has kindly agreed to allow um, like questions at any point. But if you do have a question, just um, you know, just mention your name so that uh, Laura knows who she's talking to. Um, so. Um, um, so um, Laura Balota is a reader in financial mathematics at Cass Business School London. She works in the areas of quantitative finance and risk management. She's written on topics including stochastic modeling for financial valuation and risk management, numerical methods aimed at supporting financial applications, and the interplay between finance and insurance. And um, so uh, she holds a PhD in mathematical and computational methods for economics and finance from um, University of Bergamo in Italy. And um, so um, with that, um, let's begin. And um, we're, I, I, I guess I know that we have uh, some of Laura's co-authors on the Zoom call as well. <laughs> so we're very fortunate to have such a distinguished group join us today. Laura, please take it away. Thank you very much indeed for the <laughs> nice introduction and for the invitation to speak uh, at this uh, um, seminar series. So the... Um, a uh, topic of the talk today is about Fourier-based method for the management of complex uh, insurance contracts. And this is actually a joint work with Ernst Stederlein, Torsten Schmidt, and Rashid Feinedin from the University of Freiburg and uh, the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Study. Um, okay, so the main focus today is going to be on uh, um, essentially variable annuities. So these are um, structured insurance policies that provide uh, a um, stable stream of post-retirement income, um, which is generated through the returns of uh, a portfolio, usually an equity index um, as well. Um, these contracts have um, witnessed uh, a lot of popularity over the last 10-15 uh, years, uh, also due to the fact that they carry a certain number of guarantees, which uh, essentially aim at reducing the risk exposure of the policyholder. Um, so in, these guarantees are in the form uh, usually of a floor rate. So these are contracts that are, of course, uh, quite attractive um, for investors who are seeking protection of uh, their principal um, paired with um, some relatively um, relative growth opportunities. And of course, uh, needless to say, this is uh, kind of interesting uh, in a world that is characterized by low interest rates. Um, as a matter of fact, in many countries, interest rates we know um, to be negative also over a very um, relatively long period of time. Um, let's not forget also that the markets uh, have um, uh, quite uh, high volatility at the moment. Uh, we, are, we have a pandemic in the background. So to have a, some sort of a guarantee is, of course, uh, um, very attractive. Um, now, these features that make uh, the contracts attractive are also those very same features uh, um, that make the insurers uh, slightly worried in the sense that uh, um, they cause uh, risk and uh, significant costs uh, in order to run a suitable hedging programs. So of course, uh, the uh, variable annuity writers have to focus on uh, um, product design with the aim of balancing uh, um, the two sides of the story. So the customer demands, but also the risk uh, and the cost. Uh, um, involved uh, with uh, these policies. There are many um, design uh, of uh, the contracts, uh, many benefits that they carry. If you're interested in an extensive classification, this is uh, um, a good paper um, to start from, the one by Bastianello and co-authors. So, um, but the backbones of uh, the variable annuities is essentially these three benefits, the guaranteed minimum accumulation benefit, the surrender benefit, and the death benefit. So, um, just quickly, and then we will see more of the details later on, the guaranteed minimum accumulation benefit is really the one that pays the return on uh, some equity index uh, um, fund. Um, 
to the policy holder. Um, it carries a number of guarantees, as I would say, specifically a floor for a protection of uh, the policy holder, but also an, a cap for uh, um, reduction of the exposure of the insurer. You, we also might have a ratcheting mechanism, which means that the return is um, essentially credited annually and then is locked in and compounded all the way to maturity. Um, all in all, what we have here is essentially a um, sequence of uh, options uh, um, um, are, which are going to be um, activated uh, according to certain triggering um, events. The main uh, source of risk is, of course, uh, the financial index uh, to which the policy is attached. Um, the variable annuity also typically carries uh, some provision that allowed the policyholder to leave the scheme prior to the contractual um, expiration. And uh, in this case, uh, the policyholder receive uh, the value of the fund uh, net of any surrender penalty charges. These are charges that are usually quite biting at the beginning, but the longer you stay in the policy, the less uh, um, charges that you're going to have to pay. Now, here, the main source of risk for the insurer is the lapse behavior of the policyholder. And this is quite uh, um, a complex entity to model because uh, we do not have sufficient knowledge about the true reason behind uh, the decision of the policyholder to leave uh, the scheme. There might be financial um, reasons, but there might be also personal contingencies. And the list is very long. There are some attempts at classifications uh, but it's um, a very complex problem. On top of these uh, two benefits, the variable annuity also contemplates for the, uh, well, unlucky situation in which the policyholders um, passes away before the expiration of the contract. In this case, there will be a death benefit uh, that is going to be paid to the heirs, of course, of the policyholder. And in this case, uh, the, <clears throat> the source of risk is essentially the mortality risk uh, paired with the longevity risk. Okay, so um, the way we contribute to the discussion of the variable annuities is by proposing um, essentially a hybrid model for uh, these risks. So the financial risk, uh, the surrender risk, uh, and to a certain extent also the mortality risk, um, a model which uh, um, allows for this risk uh, to be dependent uh, one of the other. And we accompany the model with an efficient numerical algorithm, as the title suggests that this is going to be linked to two Fourier transforms, and um, for the computation, of course, of the value of the policy, um, of the components and the full policy. So um, here is the agenda for um, this presentation, how I'm going to take you through um, the details of the paper. So I'm going to review a little bit more in detail the actual design of the payoffs um, for the three components of the variable annuity that we have looked at. And then we um, construct uh, our model, which is a hybrid model based on dependent time inhomogeneous LED processes for uh, essentially the three uh, sources of risk. We adopt Fourier transform for the valuation. Now, as it turns out, uh, um, this contract, uh, due to the um, surrender provision and the ratchet provision, turns out to be a very complex path dependent structure that inevitably lead to very high dimensional um, integrals. So we have to find a way of computing those integrals. And we, in the end, resort to Monte Carlo integration with important sampling. And I will talk more about this later because uh, it's really essential for a good convergence of the algorithm. And um, then I will conclude uh, with uh, a little look at some features of the variable annuity design uh, in order to get a little bit more of an understanding about the role of some key parameters uh, in, the, um, in the design. 
So we started with the, the guarantee the minimum accumulation benefit. So, so we assume a, a ratchet mechanism. As I said, here there is going to be a return that is uh, attributed to the policyholder and is going to be credited at the end of each reset date, which we are considering to be um, spread of, over the lifetime of the contract on an annual basis. So at the end of each year, the return is uh, accredited to the policyholder account and then is going to stay there. Now, these returns uh, is computed uh, on the basis of the return on a financial index, which in our presentation is going to be a stock, uh, an equity index. Um, as I was saying, there are guarantees applied. So there is a floor in the sense that if the return goes below this threshold, this is as much as guaranteed by the company. But there is also a cap, and this is to protect, of course, the insurer from um, having to pay too high return. Now, only a fraction of the return is going to be attributed anyhow, and this is in reason of this parameter C, which is the so-called participation rate. Now, of course, the payoff at maturity is going to be paid only if the, pay the policyholder is still alive and he has not surrendered the contract prior to maturity. So we have to model these two events that for now are indicated as a two random time, um, telling us whether or not the event has occurred. Um, some relatively straightforward sort of reverse financial engineering allows us to look into the payoff a little bit more in detail and to split it into a risk-free component, which depends on the guaranteed rate plus a sequence of collapses on the returns. Um, one series is struck at the floor rate and the other part is struck at the top rate. So this is the guaranteed minimum accumulation benefit. And now the problem then will be the source of risk, uh, um, financial risk, and then the source of surrender risk and mortality risk. So essentially how we are going to model these two um, random uh, events. Um, then we have the surrender benefit. So this is uh, as much as the policyholder is entitled to receive in case he decides uh, to leave uh, the contract uh, prematurely. Um, so he is entitled to receive the value of the fund in reason of the nominal amount that has invested, which is denoted by I. So the value of the fund at the moment in which uh, um, it decides to exercise the clause and leave the contract. Um, and then we multiplied here by a fraction uh, P, which essentially is capturing the uh, surrender penalty charges. As I was saying, the penalty charges are quite uh, substantial in the first few years of the policy, and then they gradually decrease over time. So this fraction will be very small at the beginning, and then it will increase towards one, not towards maturity. Of course, here we have to take into account uh, the um, event. So when is it that surrender happens, uh, uh, provided, of course, uh, that at the time point of surrender, the policy is still alive, of course. Finally, we have the death benefit. Now, um, the death benefit uh, entitles uh, the heirs of the policyholder to receive as much as been accumulated uh, in the main account. Uh, um, up to the point of maturity. So essentially, this is what we have seen in the guaranteed minimum accumulation benefit up to the time point in which the uh, passing of the policyholder is recorded by uh, the insurance company. Now, the way we are going to check uh, the um, two events of surrender and uh, death is via a sort of a monitoring um, schedule. So for surrender, Essentially, um, this uh, um, represents uh, the um, fairly realistic situation in which the, poly the insurer says to the policyholder, yes, you are allowed to surrender, but you can only surrender this many times uh, um, along the lifetime of the contract, say once a year, which is uh, the time um, steps that we are considering. 
for mortality, we have uh, another monitoring um, schedule. Um, mortality is indeed a continuous time process. However, it takes time, of course, to notify the insurance, com um, the insurance company. It takes time for insurance company to receive the notification, to record it, to verify everything that needs to be verified, and then uh, to make the payment. So here we have a schedule that is um, um, six months in our assumption, but it can be uh, made as um, frequent as one um, wishes, of course, um, and think is more pertinent to the situation. So now the question is, now that we have the, the payoffs, uh, the question is to get the model for the financial risk, mm -hmm. so for the um, stock on which we are uh, computing the returns. And then of course, uh, the two random time that gives us the time point of the surrender and the mortality. <clears throat> So we start from the financial market. So here we have uh, the stock, uh, which is already modeled under the risk neutral martingale measure and is driven by two independent time inhomogeneous LED processes, L1 and L2. And here we have essentially the exponential compensator in reason of the two volatility function, beta and sigma two. And this is, of course, uh, the term that we require to ensure that the Martingale property for the discounted asset price is satisfied. Um, then we have the fixed income market. We start from the instantaneous forward rate, uh, which gives us then uh, the bond price. The instantaneous rate and the bond price are driven by the tiny homogeneous levy process L1 that we also find in the stock dynamics. So this is kind of uh, the source of systematic risk. So what uh, induces dependence between uh, the stock market and the fixed income market. We have stochastic interest rates because, of course, uh, um, if you think about the standard term of uh, variable annuities, we are talking about 10 years onwards. So, so typical length is between 10 and 25 years. So um, we cannot definitely consider the rate of interest as constant over such a long period of time. And this is why we have this hybrid model that um, includes both the stock market and the fixed income market with dependence. Now we move on to surrender. So the surrender risk, it's actually a very important risk for the um, insurance companies to model because uh, it causes, it can cause uh, um, serious liquidity um, issues. Uh, if you have a large portion of the policyholder leaving the scheme, of course, uh, this means that there is a significant payout uh, um, for the insurance company. Now, um, there are different uh, uh, approaches uh, to model surrender. One approach is to consider surrender as uh, the solution essentially to an optimal stopping problem, um, very much on the line of American option and Bermudan option. Another um, approach is uh, essentially based on the idea that surrender is um, an exogenous event that impacts uh, the decision making of the policyholder. And uh, this exogenous event can be represented by uh, many contingencies, personal contingencies from uh, or oh, in need of some cash uh, um, to put down as a deposit to buy a house. Uh, or uh, I need the cash for a rainy days because maybe I'm, I'm out of employment uh, at the moment. Another reason are linked to the changes in the financial market conditions, which tell us that, okay, there are better opportunities out there. So maybe it's uh, time to leave the scheme. Now, um, in, in the literature, um, these two, <clears throat> Sorry, this, two, uh, th this approach essentially um, relies on two theories, which are um, known as the emergency fund hypothesis. So this is the personal contingencies story and the interest rate hypothesis. So this is uh, the, essentially the part that covers the better opportunities uh, um, in the market. We decided to adopt uh, this approach. So we are considering surrender as an exogenous event. Our rationale behind the choice is that um, 
uh, first of all, the typical policyholder decides to sign up for one of these policies um, for saving purposes, not for, uh, um, let's say, aggressive uh, investment strategy. The second reason is that the typical policyholder might not have the skills or the means or both to pursue um, you know, a very systematic uh, investment uh, strategy that optimizes uh, its return, its utility, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is why we decided to go via the idea of an exogenous event, which is going to be modeled via a surrender intensity, which allows us to compute the probability at each point in time of leaving the scheme or staying in the scheme. Now, this surrender intensity contains uh, um, two components. One component of C is fixed uh, and is what we call the baseline of surrender behavior. Um, which might go from uh, you know, cash for a rainy days to other um, very personal reasons um, to leave the scheme. Then there is a financial component that is essentially modeled via this process D, which is essentially a process which capture the spread between what the policy um, offers guaranteed which is this component, a delta T, where delta is essentially the continuously compounded version of our floor rate compounded up to maturity. So on the one hand, we have what the policy offers. And on the other hand, we have what we would get in case that we were to surrender. So we would get the funds minus the charges. And then we would have the possibility of investing this amount of money at least at um, the current rate of interest available in the market. Um, so we can go in the fixed income market and reinvest uh, our amount. Um, to this uh, spread the process, we apply essentially a function H, which uh, models, uh, so to speak, the reaction of uh, the policyholder to changes in the condition in the financial market. Um, so and this function can be essentially any function. The derivation that we are going to offer is for any generic function H that satisfies some suitable integrability condition, we have to guarantee that the free transform exists, it's only fine and so on. So it can be any function, but we advocate for a symmetric function based on the following argument. Um, for illustration, let's talk about uh, interest rates. So interest rates tomorrow could go up. Uh, and in this case, uh, maybe I have a better investment opportunity in the market. Or uh, um, it could go down and I could be motivated to leave the scheme anyhow, because maybe I'm going to find uh, a competitive refinancing opportunities out there. So for example, I want to buy a house uh, uh, by opening a mortgage uh, and there be uh, better rates uh, out there. So this could be um, potential reasons for leaving the scheme. And that means that there is uh, a, um, let's say like this, um, positive decision towards leaving the scheme regardless of the movements in the interest rate. And this is why we decided to go by a asymmetric function. So this is our surrender model. And then we have, uh, um, OK, uh, last thing that I forgot is that, of course, the spread the function depends on the financial components. So that is a way of capturing the dependence between uh, the decision to lapse and uh, the um, movement in the financial market. The last component of our model is uh, mortality. Um, here we don't do that much, uh, quite honestly. We just follow, in a way, um, a standard actuarial practice. So we model mortality by a survival probability that is controlled by a mortality intensity. The mortality intensity is initialized to the curve uh, um, via um, standard Gompers Makeham model. And to this, we superimpose a stochastic component, which depends on another uh, tiny inhomogeneous Levy process, L3, 
which is uh, assumed uh, to be independent of uh, the two processes of driving the financial market. So basically our assumption here is that there is independence between demographic risk and financial risk, which is a relatively common assumption in uh, um, the insurance world uh, and actually is um, most of the time work under um, this uh, uh, specific assumption. Okay, so now we have the payoffs function, we have uh, the model, so we are ready to price uh, um, the components of our contract using standard arbitrage principles, so we go via um, risk neutral valuation, so we take our expectation under the risk neutral martingale measure of the discounted payoff at maturity, and the policy value is going to be, of course, the sum of the three components. We are going to use Fourier transform techniques to compute these expectations. What we have to keep in mind is that these payoff functions are very complex and highly path dependent due to the um, surrender um, the surrender clause that we have added to the contract. Uh, Laura. Um, now, I Yes, Laura. Um, this is Peter Carr. Um, I do have a question. Um, yeah. So about the um, the PGMAB, um, I see that um, like the way it's written, the first bullet point, um, it looks sort of. Oh, could you we stay on the same page we were just at? Yes. Here we go. Oh. Um, okay. Well. I mean, okay, so so um, I guess um, so. My understanding then is that when you value this, the payoff time is known in advance. It's capital T, right? That is that true? Like even if someone dies or surrenders beforehand, they still getting this payoff at capital T. Is is that no, true? No. If um, what happens is that if they surrender, they are going to get the surrender benefit, which is the current value of the fund. If instead the policy of yeah. the process, yeah, if it's the policy of yeah, the then it's zero. So, okay, no, I understand now. So, so if That's someone correct. dies before capital, T, this is zero, right? This payoff is zero. This this component goes to zero. Exactly. These are the these yeah. indicator function that are here. Yes, indeed. Okay, so now I'm clear. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so as I was saying, we are going to compute these expectations via Fourier transform techniques. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you're all familiar with them, but uh, let me just uh, um, recap a few ideas uh, about uh, the procedure. So here we consider the case of a generic payoff function F um, for an underlying asset S with uh, a certain risk driver X. Then uh, standard theory shows us that the value, uh, so the price of our contract can be uh, written via this expression. So we have an integral that essentially contains uh, the characteristic function of our stochastic process. So once we know the stochastic process, uh, uh, generally we know the characteristic function too, so this is done. And then we have uh, this function f hat, which is the Fourier transform of uh, the payoff function. Um, now, the um, nicer features of this formula is, is that, of course, all the random part uh, is captured straight away via the characteristic function and is completely separated from uh, the payoff function. So we can treat the two um, separately. For the case in question, we have call options. So this F hat will be um, the Fourier transform um, of the payoff of a uh, call option. Now we have to remember that we have to use a dampening parameter in order to guarantee that this integral, this expression is um, finite, converges, it gives us a nice number and doesn't just go off to infinity all over the sudden. Now, for the call option, for the schema that we are using, the dampening parameter is a constant greater than 1. Actually, you can fix it to 1.1, and we have already um, high accuracy and um, um, in no time at all in terms of computing. 
Um, I would like to refer to the paper by Eberlein, Grau, and Papa Pantaleon for full details uh, and all the necessary assumption required uh, for uh, the derivation of the formula and the convergence, um, of course. Um, okay, so now we are essentially ready for the main results. So here we have uh, the valuation formula for uh, the three components of the uh, variable annuity. So we start from the uh, guaranteed minimum accumulation benefit. I am not going to bore you with the proof of these theorems. Um, they are quite uh, involved. Uh, but if you're interested in the details, please get in touch. We will be happy to share um, the draft of the paper. Now, the point that I want to highlight uh, um, to highlight are the following. First of all, let's have a look at the structure of the price. So here we have the probability of uh, surviving up to maturity and beyond, the discount factor. This is essentially the uh, cost of the guarantee of the flora, essentially. And here we have the values of the sequence of call options. The one struck at the flow rate and the one struck at the uh, cut rate. Now, these functions A1 and A2, they are functions of uh, these two, M and N, which are complex functions involving the characteristic functions of uh, the driving processes, the Fourier transform of the call option, and the exponential of the surrender function H. So that um, symmetric function that we apply to the spread uh, uh, between what the contract offers and what can be instead obtained in the market. Um, M and N are complex function in every possible exception of the um, word in the sense that they are defined in the complex space and they are very involving. And this is the reason why I've decided not to really show um, what they look like. Uh, full expressions are available in the paper. But the very um, important point is this one. If we look at the integrals that we are computing, these are uh, k-dimensional integrals where k is uh, the number of uh, monitoring dates of the surrender events. So assume that you, we have a um, 10 years policy assume that we allow the policyholder um, to surrender um, every year at the end of each year, then this is a 10-dimensional integral and this is a nine-dimensional integral. Um, this is just to give you um, an idea of the scale um, that we are talking about when it comes to integration. Um, following the same logic, we can uh, um, determine the value of the surrender benefit. Um, so here is essentially um, relatively the same story. We have high dimensional integrals. So here the dimension uh, progressively increases from two all the way um, to the um, size, uh, essentially the, the number of monitoring dates that we are um, allowing. Finally, we have the value of the death benefit. Um, here it becomes really uh, more involved due to the fact that, that we are monitoring uh, mortality on uh, a different time scale compared to the surrender time scale and the ratchet time scale. So we need to decompose each single piece and then put it back together. But the point is that again we have these functions uh, um, with uh, high dimensional integrals uh, that we have uh, uh, to compute. So the problem of actually getting numbers out of uh, this formulae. Um, of course we know that in order to compute uh, um, numerically compute a Fourier transform there are many methods available from FFT to COS uh, to many other implementation. However, here we are really talking about very high dimensional integrals. And as far as I know, um, FFT technology, for example, um, is implemented in standard packages that reaches uh, two dimensions. So um, it's not adequate for the purpose. I have a Fourier transform are nothing but integrals. So why don't we look at the quadrature method? 
specifically random quadrature method because the standard um, deterministic quadrature method like Romberg or anything adaptive quadrature or anything, um, they don't go beyond the three dimension. Uh, beyond the CPU time is absolutely prohibited and already three dimension can be challenging if the integrand function is as sophisticated as uh, in our case. Um, I have done some numerical testing and here we are talking about in three dimension to get um, a price in about four hours for uh, um, our um, death benefit. Um, so that's not uh, very um, promising. So we decided to go via the random quadrature method, which means essentially Monte Carlo integration. So we take the integrand function, um, so those um, complex M and N function that I showed you before. And then what we have to do is to um, figure out a good distribution from which to extract our random numbers that we are going to plug in the integrand function. And then the value of our integral is simply a sample mean. I'm saying simply because uh, um, now all that matters is the size of the Monte Carlo sample. So how many iteration we are running. And the dimension is no longer of concern, not in the computation of the sample mean, not in the computation of the error. So the sample variance that then enters, of course, the B standard error. Now, the point here is that we have to be very careful about the distribution of choice. So where do we get the random numbers that we plug in into the integrand function? We have to remember that we are integrating complex function meant as defining the complex space, so they are highly oscillatory. So we have to be really um, careful in choosing the distribution T, and therefore we have to um, implement the importance of sampling in order to guarantee um, decent convergence for our algorithm. And the, the choice uh, will be very much inspired by the surrender function H that we choose and apply um, to compute the intensity uh, of surrender. Just to give you an illustration of what I mean, this is one of the two integrand function for a very simple case, uh, so low dimension case. If I have a parabolic uh, um, function for the um, surrender intensity, I have this blue curve. Um, on the real uh, part, the imaginary part, well, this uh, usually is not much of a concern because uh, it should cancel out. Um, if I use a modulus function, here I have something that is much more um, peaked. Uh, but there might be also negative oscillation here that due to the scale we don't see. They become more obvious if we look at the n function, that is the one that enters uh, essentially the calculation of the stream of uh, um, call option uh, structures. So you see that here we have um, uh, that this function is strongly peak around zero, but then it oscillates quite significantly and there are uh, negative areas, which we have to take care of uh, um, quite carefully in order to have uh, positive prices. Otherwise, uh, um, we might end up having something negative and that is not very uh, convenient. So um, let me go into the details of the numerical experiment and so that we can talk about how we choose these sampling um, distributions. So the um, financial market drivers are two um, normal inverse Gaussian processes. So we know the characteristic function, we have everything that we need to know. For the mortality, um, we are just taking a um, Brownian motion. This allows us to um, obtain uh, survival probabilities in closed form solution. So that helps uh, with uh, the uh, computation. Here we have uh, the set of parameters for uh, the model. Now we are considering for um, illustration a um, 10 years policy. We have uh, annual uh, uh, ratchet mechanism, uh, annual um, checking of the surrender, while we, we are checking mortality every six months. So these are the uh, grids uh, um, steps. 
Now, food important sampling. So, as I said, we are going with a, um, on one hand, with a parabolic uh, um, function for the definition of the surrender function. Given that we are taking exponential of this function h, here the power of x squared inevitably leads us to think about the multivariate Gaussian distribution with independent components. If instead we work with the modulus, so here the power of the modulus of x, that leads us to think about the multivariate Cauchy distribution. Um, so this is how we are choosing our important sampling uh, um, densities. Uh, we are going to center those distribution around zero, and the choice is due to the fact that if we look at this plot, the peaks uh, are centered around the zero. So we want to catch uh, this, and this is why we are placing this at a zero. The remaining parameters uh, for uh, the two distributions, so the normal and the Cauchy distribution, are really chosen uh, by numerical trial and error. Um, for the Cauchy distribution, actually, um, the formula gives us uh, a very um, good hint uh, at what value we might choose, uh, and indeed, it kind of works. Uh, for the Gaussian distribution, is a little bit more uh, um, really intuition. And finally, we have uh, the results. Um, so here I have uh, the results for uh, um, the three components of the variable annuity and the overall contract for uh, the two uh, intensity function. Um, the standard error is uh, expressed in percentage of the original price, just to um, have a little bit of an idea of what uh, the scale of the error is. And this is the CPU time, how much it takes uh, to get uh, um, one of the prices. Uh, this CPU time is essentially an average time across 100 batches of 1 million iteration. Um, in order to make sure that my Monte Carlo routine uh, does what it's supposed to do, I also benchmarked it uh, um, for a low dimension case against uh, computing those integral with a built-in function in MATLAB. And we had an average bias of 0.0044%, which I thought was pretty good. So we were on the right track. So um, here it is. We have uh, a model. Uh, that allows us uh, to um, capture financial risk, uh, surrender risk, and mortality risk. It's a model that allows us uh, um, to obtain a semi-closed form solution for the values of the three components, semi-closed in the sense that we have to compute a multidimensional integral. And we have a routine via Monte Carlo integration with uh, important sampling that uh, can help us uh, um, compute uh, the prices. Um, I can also mention that further speed up uh, in terms of the CPU time are possible uh, by looking carefully at the integrand function and exploiting some features that involve uh, the, um, uh, the exponential compensators. But um, here it becomes uh, um, a little bit too intricate for a presentation. The details are offered um, in the paper. What I would like to conclude with is a very brief uh, um, mini sensitivity analysis on uh, um, a couple of parameters that attracted our attention, which are the participation rate and the cap rate. Indeed, these are parameters that significantly affect the product marketability. So how attractive is the policy to um, potential um, customers? But it are also two parameters that affect the exposure of the insurer, especially in presence of the ratchet mechanism. Because if uh, um, during one year or maybe two consecutive years, we are experiencing very high return, then there is a significant amount that gets locked in and carried forward up to maturity. And the policy, the, sorry, the insurance company has to um, honor the agreement. So it has to pay this amount at maturity, the moment in which the payment is due. 
So we have used our routine to get the numbers. So here I'm just illustrating the full value of the variable annuity. And for uh, several uh, values of the participation rate in correspondence of uh, three values of the cap rate, so a cap rate of 5%, 7.5%, and 20%, which is as good as saying there is no cap uh, at mm -hmm. all. And um, we can notice here that, uh, of course, uh, um, the cap rate is really crucial in managing this trade-off between the demand of the customer and the um, exposure of the um, insurance company. And because uh, essentially if I fix uh, the cap rate at 5%, which is this blue line, I see that my uh, variable annuity value becomes almost indifferent um, to the participation rate. So this gives us a little bit of leeway and um, to um, you know, accommodate for the demands uh, of the uh, customer. So this is essentially everything that I wanted to tell you today. And um, so I hope that I've been able to convince you that we have a general framework for the valuation and risk management of uh, complex life insurance products. Um, we envisage also the applicability of such technique uh, to other high dimension payoff structure and uh, particularly the example that I had in mind was uh, the, the example of counterparty value risk because uh, to a certain extent uh, the structure is the same if we consider that we have to include uh, uh, wrong way risk and right way risk. So the possibility of default of the counterparty and the possibility of default uh, of um, uh, the prime party. Um, the results are uh, in this um, uh, paper. Um, at the moment uh, is just a preprint. Uh, um, it's not available online yet. So if you're interested, please uh, uh, get in touch. And as I said, we will be uh, happy to share the paper. Thank you very much for you. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Um, so um, just um, something I noticed right at the end, um, like at, at the beginning of your talk, I, I thought you mentioned that there would be a guarantee on the whole like payoff. So sort of globally as opposed to locally. And, um, but if we just, could you go back one slide? Um, Cause I think I can make my point just one back. Um, okay, so actually it wasn't here, sorry. Well, anyway, maybe one more. Um, yeah, this is what I wanted, thank you. So so this payoff for the GMAB, um, like it's, it's what in practitioners call um, locally floored and locally capped. Um, and, um, but let's say there's no global floor here. So a global floor would mean that you would put a um you would be maxing with another constant at the on the outside <laughs> okay which would be called a global floor okay yeah yeah okay and and so but but i'm thinking that so i'm so my question is um am i describing something that doesn't exist anymore i know it used to um it, it, and um it, but and if it does exist um could it easily be handled is the question <clears throat> Um, okay, um, I have been looking at uh, a number of papers in the literature describing several design uh, of uh, this GMAB, and this seems to be the kind of typical design um, that is adopted. Um, I have never seen a global uh, guarantee, to be honest, but I believe okay. uh, that um, at the end of the day, one should um, have a look out at the composition into uh, let's say the guaranteed component plus the sequence of option would work. Uh, I suppose that there should, okay, I'm not saying that the formula will look nice. Um, mm -hmm. Probably it will be even more involved with derivation, but I suppose that it should be possible. Um, okay. So okay, so a different point is that um, the nice thing about this local structure that you, you looked at is that it sort of very clearly decomposes into um, n options, <laughs> um, yes, exactly. uh, like yeah, and um, so so it suggests uh, a hedging strategy that does not use 
um, the underlying alone, um, but actually uses options, vanilla options on the underlying as part of the hedge. Yeah. Um, and is that something you've looked into? We didn't look at the hedging at this stage, uh, no. But it's um, something, of course, uh, to keep in mind. Also, because uh, there is a very long maturity involved uh, in the, um, at least for the guaranteed part. So um, we are talking about, uh, as I said, well, we use uh, 10 years, but this is really the minimum term. Yeah, so it wouldn't be exchange traded options as a result. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's right. In the, let's put it like this. If the ratchet mechanism is uh, once a year, then we are calling about, we are talking about one year call option spanning um, an horizon from today all the way to maturity, so maybe 20 years. So this is maybe something that could be handled. Um, yeah, so, so like in the over-the-counter market, you can expect, you know, to get quotes <laughs> on- Yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. Like, uh, uh, you know, for any maturity. And, um, but, and these are quote forward start options, right? Like the underlying of each option is a return over a future period yeah um, which is that capital r so these yeah, are not exactly. even you know putting aside the maturity question these are not uh you know vanilla options i'm talking about hedging with i'm actually talking about hedging with so-called like i call you know cliques forward starts whatever people call them but they're options on future returns as opposed to options on future prices <laughs> okay yeah. okay <clears throat> yeah Okay. Um, of course, uh, in this case, uh, the fact that we have a ratcheting mechanism um, should kind of help. But there are other design, uh, the so-called uh, um, point to end, in which uh, only the value at maturity of the reference fund matters. So there mm -hmm. isn't such a um, accumulate, and then then it becomes a very long-term product uh, because we are. There is a usual decomposition with an option if I have a guarantee, but that would be a, really a 20 years. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Okay. One more question. Um, so I let's say the general framework I recall is um, like time in homogeneous levy processes. So um, and the t so and is is it like deterministic time in homogeneity or stochastic time in homogeneity? Uh, deterministic. Yes. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Um, let me go back to the model. Um, sorry, I got the wrong one. Um, so here we have um, essentially uh, this uh, volatility function, beta and sigma. Well, the way we consider it in the implementation are deterministic. Uh, so, okay. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah. But then let's say. So if one, you know, I know it's already complicated, but what I'm thinking is if, if one wanted to extend to at least like stochastic and, and to keep things simple, let's say independently stochastic, um, you know, sigmas here and betas, mm -hmm. um, it seems like it's just another, like, it seems like it's a fairly straightforward extension. You just have to do another expected value over the random sigma, random beta. And then you're done, like under independence, it's that. Yes, like yeah. uh, I would say so. From the point of view of the implementation, I don't even want to think about it right now. But okay. yes, I think. <laughs> okay. 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 That's fine. All right. Very good. Um, and um, this structure that we have here, it's building in dependence between the fixed income market and the stock market, right? Yeah. Um, and can you just remind us how that happens? Um, in, I mean, in the sense that we have the same source of risk uh, driving. The, oh, okay, yeah, 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 that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, is okay, yeah. perhaps uh, a well, is one possible way of inducing the dependence between the two markets? Of course, uh, um, Ernst yeah. uh, has uh, another type of construction for the same purpose that is a little bit more involving. Um, but I suppose that the technology to deal with the technicalities of the contract would be essentially the same. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so, so um, we have time for uh, questions from the uh, audience. 
um, feel free to unmute and uh, ask away. Um, and um, so um, I know that this structure of variable annuities has been around a long time, very big, and um, is still a major focus of research interest, I would say. It's a, it's a very large portion of uh, the market, and there are uh, more uh, uh, design coming out. Like there is this registered uh, index linked annuity that apparently at the moment uh, is um, um, really attracting a lot of uh, a lot of attention. And the design is not too dissimilar from from. Okay. So of course, uh, given given current market condition, I suppose uh, that is um, a good opportunity where to you know for saving purposes. Uh, I'm yeah. not saying investment purposes, but uh, uh, yeah. So I remember some older literature on variable annuities that argued that the way they were being priced then, they were being underpriced. Um, and um, you know, I'm thinking that you have a you know a sophisticated model here. You're you know, the numbers you gave us are, you know, probably not underpricing uh, the... Uh, uh, you know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think it very much depends on the surrender. Um, we don't have uh, sufficient data to calibrate uh, the surrender model. Also, these are usually proprietary data of the insurance companies. And, um, but um, concerning all the papers, yes, I started working on uh, this type of product uh, about 21 years ago, mm -hmm. when it was the issue of the guaranteed annuity option that was uh, issued during the 70s and then essentially brought uh, equitable life uh, down to bankruptcy. And that was the, um, the oldest insurance company in the world. And huh. uh, yes, they were not considered. I mean, uh, interest rates uh, were considered uh, almost fixed. Uh, um, there was not much of a consideration about the fact that uh, when this contract had been issued, there was a serious problem of the high inflation. So the guarantees were skewed, so to speak, uh, towards very high values that were not very realistic. And mm -hmm. then uh, the standard actuarial technique was to, you know, reserve uh, uh, somehow for uh, these additional benefits based on the current value. And the current value was practically zero. And um, so a lot has happened since then. And I think uh, uh, the problem with equitable life is what pushed uh, um, the insurance industry to look into this contract more carefully and have them priced uh, more consistently with uh, um, what the rest of the financial market is doing, essentially. Okay. So there were a lot of can, issues related to this, yes. Can, can I just ask a question about the surrender, your assumption on the surrender yeah. benefit? So I, it went by pretty quickly, but I think you said you assumed that uh, it was essentially random, that there was no uh, systematic variable in uh, people's exercise of the surrender benefit. And I wonder what happens if you assume that essentially the policyholders are conspiring against the insurance company to, uh, uh, to, okay. to all, you know, <laughs> so from the point of view of the systemic risk to the insurance company, um, what happens? Okay, yeah, no, we, no, I, I personally, I didn't consider the problem in, in this respect. I thought uh, about uh, a policyholder that uh, maybe doesn't have access, uh, you know, to Bloomberg uh, terminals to check uh, systematically the movement of the reference fund. Now, the other thing that should be said is that here we assume as a, as a fund essentially um, a stock uh, market, but um, these funds are uh, not just uh, formed by equity. Um, they are funds that are very well diversified, that they contain equity, bonds, uh, uh, real estate, uh, and so on. So kind of what you were saying seems, um, it was a little bit alien to me. I didn't think about that at all, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um... So the, I, I think, is the question about the, the assumption um, that was done that um, surrender is exogenous and, um, you know, and the, maybe the question is when to think about potentially like strategic 
surrender yeah. instead of exogenous. That's what it was about, right? So yeah, yeah exactly. I, yeah, I, um, yeah, very much what happened recently, you know, with those people on the Reddit platform, essentially. But no, I, I didn't think about that possibility. So, um, so I, I think. I, of, yeah, so, so I, 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 I can tell you that the insurance companies look at actuarial data on how people actually do uh, yeah. exercise surrender, and uh, it's closer to your assumption than to a strategic assumption. But uh, there, there's some concern over whether everybody gets strategic, and uh, then you know the value could go up quite a bit. Okay, okay, okay. No, um, as I said, I haven't considered this one, but uh, okay. It's an um, interesting comment, thank you, because this can, you know, uh, be good, good yeah, for the thought. Comment the that was, um, so last week we had Dwayne Farmer present, and he, he talked about market efficiency. And the way he sort of, he expressed market efficiency was um, that it's sort of a, let's say, a first order effect, but not, but let's say, you know, um, at the second order, it can, there can be sort of inefficiencies that are worth, you know, trying to exploit. And so the sort of sense is, I mean, I'm thinking this is just philosophical, but, um, you know, like one, let's say the first or, you know, so instead of saying, well, it's either exogenous or strategic, it's actually yeah. more like philosophically that, um, let's say, to capture things at first order, do it exogenously as it's done here. But then sort of to capture, you know, less important, but still there <laughs> effects, um, you know, perhaps it's worth thinking about um, the strategic Yeah, aspect. definitely, definitely. Uh, surely um, what is uh, difficult uh, is to have an idea of uh, already the, the parameters that drive uh, this, let's say exogenous, uh, um, surrender intensity because as I said uh, already having an idea of how to fix those parameters is not very simple so thinking about a strategic uh, um, strategy um, for surrender really uh, starts being a little bit daunting but definitely it's good for yeah you. no I, we we agree <laughs> let's say no we, we uh, said that this is I mean we said no. that this is possible right uh, you, you can have yeah. people on a, on a platform and uh, bring um, some entities down or close. Yeah, I mean, let's say, you know, I mean, it, you know, as I think we're all appreciating, it amounts to valuing Bermudan options. And, um, you know, <laughs> and, and let's say, so, you know, sort of a long staff Schwartz, Monte Carlo type approach. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like the way to go. And they usually don't think about 4A methods in that context, but I suppose one could, you know, so, um, so that would be quite yeah, a- yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was saying, yeah. Yeah, that would be like the ultimate paper. <laughs> Uses every <laughs> single, uh, every single idea in you know, quantitative finance. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's wrap up. So this was tremendous. Um, thank you very much, Laura. It was really an interesting uh, talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so anyway, we'll we'll continue next week. I uh, hope you all come back um, in seven days and um, have a good week, everyone. I'm I'm going to be ending this, ending the recording and ending the session. Okay, okay, bye. Goodbye.